Who wants to start with Adam? You let me know when um, we're live and I'll go ahead and start. we are live and streaming. Welcome to the September 23rd, 2021 BAR small virtual meeting. My name is Lindsay Van Slambrook. The other board members present today are Eddie Fava, Julia Martin, and Fillmore Wilson will be joining us momentarily. City staff present today are um, Kim Lavin, BARS, BARS Administrator, and Tori Parrish, City Architect. The order of today's meeting will be as follows. First, we'll have an introduction and overview of the project by city staff um, to the board and for the public. This will be followed by an applicant presentation, which will be 10 minutes long. Uh, you should clearly state your name first and last for the record if you are speaking and persons affiliated with the project, such as owners, developers, uh, designers, and consultants should all speak during this 10 minute period. Uh, by ordinance, the members of the board can ask questions of the applicant at any time by custom we do so on the heels of the applicant's presentation. This will be followed by a period of public comment. If you are speaking um, on, as a member of the public, please state your name first and last very clearly for the record. And I'd like to remind the applicant, this is not the time to respond to any comments. Uh, public comment will be followed by city staff comments and recommendations. This will, uh, on the heels of the city staff comments and public comment, the applicant will have a period of five minutes in which to clarify or respond to anything raised during public comments or by city staff during their comments and recommendations. Uh, this applicant response period will be followed by board discussion and a vote. At this time, the applicant presentation and public comment is closed. The applicant can clarify inaccurate information uh, if they raise their hand and I recognize them or if a board member has a specific question for the applicant. Please be aware that uh, our operating procedure will change upon the return to in-person meetings, the date of which has not yet been determined. Once we return to in-person meetings, we'll discontinue the use of Zoom, but continue to live stream on our City of, Detroit, City of Charleston YouTube channel. The public may speak in person at the meeting or provide written comments in advance. The deadline to submit these written comments will be changing to 12 p.m. on the day prior to the meeting. Written comments will be provided to the board members in advance of the meeting and acknowledged by myself, the chair, during the agenda item. Please refer to each meeting's agenda for updates and changes to our operating procedures as we return to in-person meetings. Item number 642 Charlotte Street has been deferred by the applicant. Uh, I ask that you please limit your comments to architecture only. Comments related to zoning, such as parking, traffic, lot coverage, and livability concerns are not within the purview of this, of this board and cannot be voiced here. Now I will turn it over to Kim for some virtual meeting protocol. Thanks, Lindsay. Staff will control the PowerPoint presentation that includes everything submitted by the applicant by the deadline in accordance with submittal requirements. Applicants simply need to ask staff to advance to the next slide during your presentation. Applicants, staff, and board members are required to give their name whenever speaking. Video and microphone have been disabled for all attendees. Attendees, not board members or staff, will only be given the capability to speak when they're called on during the public comment period. Chat and the Q&A functions have been disabled for everyone. Public comment. The applicants, all team members, and the public have been required to register, indicate the project they wish to comment on, and submit any documents in advance of the meeting. Just as in an in-person meeting, all applications heard today are part of a public meeting format. If you have registered and will speak during the public comment portion of the meeting, you will need to state your name and address for the record. Those members of the public that have registered will be called on in order by project. Staff can call on the registered members of the public to speak for each project. Unregistered members of the public who raise their hand will not be called on. The board, board members will be polled by the chairperson for comments and their vote on a motion. Each member when voting should respond yay in favor or nay not in favor. Chair shall reread the motion verbatim, and the board member making the motion should correct the chair if she has not reread the motion accurately. If a board member needs to refuse, he or she will be temporarily removed from the meeting and placed back in the meeting at the start of the next agenda item. 
If the board needs to go into an executive session, they'll call into a separate conference line and all video and audio on Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they're ready to return to the regular meeting. Results and staff comments will be posted on the city website at www.charleston.sc.gov. These proceedings are being recorded and broadcast to the City of Charleston's YouTube channel. Thank you, Kim. Were we able to locate um, Fillmore? Fillmore is missing in action. Okay. He is definitely there waiting to be let in. I don't know, that link that we had from the last meeting wasn't, wasn't proper, I guess. Hmm. Okay, I'll move forward with agenda item one unless I'm not seeing him on here either. What? Well, um, let's move forward with agenda item number one. Okay. Agenda item one is 115 Wentworth Street. It's requesting final approval for a complete demolition of the building. The building isn't rated. It's in the Harleston Village neighborhood. It was built in 1950 and is in the old and historic district. Previously on August 12th, the motion was deferral for submittal of a site plan with hardscaping proposal at a later date. And just for some context, here we have the property uh, on the south side of Wentworth Street uh, at Cumming. Here's the building, how it currently stands, the scaffolding surrounds the front facade. looking at it from both sides. And this is from that intersection looking southwest. And this is looking east. This is looking west on Wentworth and looking east. Here are Sanborn maps. Um, you can see the 1941 Sanborn map. The building hadn't been uh, constructed yet. Um, but by 1955, it's there. And with that said, I'll turn it over to our applicant, Mr. Simmons Young. <coughs> You're on mute. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. I don't think I have the option to turn on the camera, but that's fine. Um, my name is Simmons Young. I am here on behalf of Grace Church, who owns the building um, at uh, 115 Wentworth. Uh, they also own uh, two neighboring lots, and uh, we were here uh, last time to talk about 115 and a half Wentworth, um, which is being saved uh, in this building. We asked for demolition, and we're now going, uh, bringing that forward based on the motion for a uh, request for a site plan. But I did want to go through the slides also and just um, talk, talk to you some more about some of the items that are going on with this building that help to show why we're asking for demo. Um, let's see, uh, Kim, can you skip to uh, the next slide? Uh, I guess slide two through five. Um, so this is just, this, these are the three sites. Our site is the one with the white roof in the middle of the building. It's a flat roof. Next slide, please. Uh, this is showing uh, Glenn McConnell dorm. The College of Charleston dorm is in the foreground and our building is there um, with the red arrow on it. Next slide, please. This is it from the street. Um, and we'll talk about uh, in a little while the aesthetic qualities of it. The scaffolding is no fun to have in front of a building, but the building itself has some uh, aesthetic challenges. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, okay, this is just a, a property line was abandoned and these three lots were established. That was when a building on the corner was demolished, a nicer uh, building. 
Uh, next slide, please. 115 Wentworth is right there in the middle. It used to be a dentist office um, and was given to Grace Church. Oh uh, gosh, I'm not certain on the age, but maybe 15 or 20 years ago, uh, perhaps longer. Slide, uh, next slide, please. The Sanborn maps, um, which Kim already reviewed, uh, showing when the building came through. And um, next slide, please. This is flood zone AE10. This and the next slide is, we're right on the border there. Let's go to the next slide. This is what it looks like when it rains uh, in a heavy uh, rain around there. I live uh, not far away from here, a couple blocks away, so I drive through this, uh, or around this rather, a fair amount. Um, next slide, please. And there it is from uh, right up the street. Next slide, please. That's our intersection. And you'll notice here the College of Charleston building on the right-hand side um, is diagonally across the street from us. They've got sandbags that they just leave there because it floods so much. Yeah. Next slide. These, this is, comes from a 2006 City of Charleston GIS map. You can see we're uh, in a drainage basin. If you look at those numbers around us uh, for heights, this is one of the lowest spots. There's some down to the bottom left um, that also flood, but uh, we've got a lot of 9.1s and 8.8s, 10.5s that all come into this 6.5 elevation that's in the middle of this intersection. Next slide, please. Uh, we worked on 98 Wentworth, which is a block away, and this is one of the um, responses we got back in our comments. Um, it says this is in a flood zone. Here's a few things you can do. You can either show it's above flood, ours is not, this one is not. You can elevate the structure, um, so you know you could uh, lift this building. It's a CMU building, unreinforced cinder block. So that'd be difficult. Um, you can provide a valid third party appraisal showing that we're going to spend less than 50% of the value of the building fixing uh, the building, excluding the land, uh, fixing this up. And we'll see in a little bit what it would take to do this. The um, brick veneer alone needs to come down and, and, and that, so that would, we're going to go past this 50% uh, from my experience working in other buildings. Uh, and the costs associated. Uh, or you can apply for a theme of variance. That's not a good idea. This building is um, not very high quality and it's in a very bloody zone. I'm not even sure the variance would be granted. Uh, it doesn't seem like it would be a good idea to grant it. Next slide, please. Uh, and then so now we're looking at the building for aesthetic qualities. I think if I brought this you know, I, I don't think I would build, bring a building designed like this to the BAR to review. It's sort of squat in nature. The proportions of the windows are, are um, you know, it's horizontal rather than vertical proportions, which you're seeing as sort of outlined in the guidelines. Um, and it's, it's just not a, um, a high quality building. So we can move to the next um, slide, please. Um, and I'm going to skip through some of these. You, you all have seen a lot of them, um, but I guess on this, this side, we're seeing some aluminum frame windows. There's a, one, I think I see one, maybe two wood frame windows, which are not, you know, that's not a great architectural style to be looking for. Um, next slide, please. Back of the building showing the cinder block and where the brick veneer is applied. And I think I, I pointed out, uh, on site, and um, we'll see in these next slide. I think we just follow the red lines for, um, for these next 20 or so slides. We'll try and go quickly. Next, next slide, please. Uh, there's an alley between those two buildings, which you'll have seen. Uh, next slide. Okay, there's rust jacking of these steel lintels, which pushes the brick out, so the steel lintels need to be removed. Ideally, you would put stainless steel back if you were going to invest in this building. Next slide, please. Um, this is the brick that sort of started it all. 
when we did when we asked um, structural engineer Russell Rosen to evaluate the building, this stood out as a dangerous condition that prompted the um, installation of the uh, scaffolding in order to protect the health and life safety of pedestrians moving below it. Um, the next slide, please. And we'll see what that looks like in just a second. This is uh, cracked brick, particularly at the alley. Um, so it's more typical of, of cracks to follow a mortar joint rather than to actually crack the brick. It indicates maybe something else is going on, like these buildings are moving at different rates. Next slide, please. Um, we'll go through these four windows rather quickly. Um, next slide, please. This is the steel lintel. We removed that rolling brick I pointed out, and we'll get a shot of what the um, ties of the brick are. Next slide, please. Um, some of the diagonal cracks at window two, that's off to the right. And you'll notice it doesn't really stop uh, until it reaches the top of the wall. So it's a um, potential parapet problem. Next slide, please. Um, here's some cracks below the sill. Again, not following the mortar joint. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another one. I think we can just look to the right of uh, the red lines for a few slides here. Next slide. These are all. These are showing similar things. Uh, crack going up to the left. Next slide. Um, here's the broken steel lintel that they pulled out of there. So um, they, they left that part in because it didn't make sense to um, remove that other brick and open, you know, un open up another can of worms. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is one of the. Uh, left, just to let you know. Oh, what's that? You've got about two minutes left. Okay, um, let's skip through these red lines. This is one important one: rusted screw jack. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we'd want to, would need to take all the brick off. Okay. Um, I'm just going to skip through those. You all can ask me questions, um, up until, uh, slide. Uh, I think the Rosen report is at the end. Um, Kim, it's one of the first typewritten pages. There we go. Um, so I'll read uh, some points from his slide very quickly. Uh, high water, so it's um, failing brick veneer, rusting steel lentils, water entry into the building system, meaning the structural floor system, door and window repairs, HVAC systems. This is not, this is not in his report, but it's HVAC systems, electrical and plumbing would be typical architectural things we would do if we're going to fix this building. Um, Next slide. Um, and I was, uh, let's see, I think we can go to the next, um, skip through Mr. Rosen's report here. Uh, that was, yeah, oops. Um, there was an asbestos containing materials report. There was also um, a contractor that we had to look at it for pricing. Those were the other two things. These are uh, fences in the neighborhood. As I mentioned, I live there. I run this neighborhood a lot. One of the character defining features is, um, are these um, wrought iron fences with a low brick wall. So that's what we're proposing to go back with. I think we can just slide through those. There's one with a parking lot, that one yeah, behind it. This is uh, Grace Church's wall. And what we're proposing to do is demo that building and extend the wall, um, install some landscaping closer to the street. Um, use that green fence material and then um, next, slide and then it should be the last slide after that. Uh, these are some details of the fence showing the brick um, and where the green would be, where landscaping would be, some uh, and forest gravel um, in the back. And in summary, um, I would just say that um, the health and life safety issues for this building, it's of low structural quality of unreinforced cinder block structure with screw ties that are causing um, a life safety problem with the bricks. Uh, we think they may fall off. So I would spend 
a lot of money on that scaffolding to protect people. Materials, the windows are nothing particularly nice. Those aluminum frame ones are really not nice. The other ones are bad proportion. They're eight over eights wide, uh, inherent historic integrity. Um, this block has a lot of great buildings and, and this is uh, from the 19th century and this is not one of them. Uh, value uh, in the context of the neighborhood. I don't think this building's um, contributing to the character of, of the historic district. Um, so that's why we come to you with this proposal for demolition and, uh, and as requested the uh, plan of what we would put back. And that, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you, Simmons. Um, do my fellow board members have any questions for the applicant? Um, so it's just because I wasn't here last time. Do you do you know for sure the vintage of the building next door that's being retained? Um, we do know that it is. Uh, I couldn't give you an exact year, but mid nineteen forties. Found a newspaper article, Julia, uh, and I want to say it's forty one or forty three. I can. It's in the. Um, let me roll back. Did that Sanborn map indicate? The 115 and a half, that was yes. a 1941 Sanborn, so it was before 1941, okay. So 10 or 15 years before the second building was fused up against it. That's right. Okay, thanks. 31. 31? 31 for the okay. building that they're retaining. Okay, thank you. Any other board questions? I have one, um, Mr. Young, does the removal of 115 uh, in any way compromise 115 and a half is, or, or it looks like there's an alley or something separated. So my guess is not, but just your opinion of that. Um, my opinion is that we uh, are gonna, <laughs> we have engaged uh, Russell Rosen to work on this with us. So I think it's important to have a structural engineer involved, but since we're only connected at the first floor and there's not a wall wiped out, it's just doorways going between 115 and 115 and a half, I think we're gonna be in good shape. Very good, thank you. All right, we'll move on to public comment. Kim. We have Aaron Minigan from um, Preservation Society. Aaron, you have the floor. Thank you, Erin uh, Minigan with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant study of a hardscape plan for the site per the board's previous motion. However, our inability to support demolition of this building continues to be based on the inappropriateness of its replacement with a surface parking lot in the heart of Harleston Village. The Preservation Society is grateful for the opportunity to have spoken with Grace Church and the architect about this request. While we strive to support the programmatic needs of the historic congregation to facilitate their continued growth downtown, we maintain our position that the proposal to demolish this building for the creation of a parking lot is regressive from an urban planning perspective. Given the adjacent corner lot is already vacant, this demolition would further contribute to a conspicuous and undesir undesirable void in the streetscape. Though not a particularly exceptional building, it does fit within the height, scale, mass, and rhythm of building patterns on the streetscape. We support the position of the Harleston Village Neighborhood Association to retain the building and encourage the applicant to study alternatives for its continued use. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And do we have anyone else, Kim? I'm not That's it. More letters. Oh, we got it. All right, if you'll give us city staff comments and recommendations, please. The applicant has responded well to the conditions set forth in the August 12th meeting. The grass feature and planting plan is a positive addition to the site. So the staff's recommending final. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Simmons, did you want to respond to anything raised during public comment or any of the staff comments? Um, yes, I would like to respond uh, with a question, actually. I think this, this came up at the last meeting and, and I was a little confused by um, uh, whether it's correct that the building is considered on its, on its own merit or 
by what comes after it and, and just ask for some clarity on that as, as you'll um, discuss the matter. Thank you. The, the board before the board today is simply the, the demolition request. So not what is we are not approving what is coming after uh, today. Okay. Did you have anything else? Um, no, I except well, one other thing is to say that we have studied um, the potentials for reusing the existing building uh, with a contractor um, and and an architect and uh, have decided the demolition is the best option for this building. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move into board discussion and a vote at this time. Um, can I start with just a question for staff? There was mention of the Harleston Village Neighborhood Association having a position. Was that a letter that was submitted at some point or? You're, you're right. There was a letter submitted. My apologies. Lindsay, do you see that in the public comment folder? I do not. If you could email it to me very quickly, I can read it. Was this at the, the prior meeting? We read this into the record? No, this was submitted recently. Um, I'll just open it on my screen. I can see it. Lindsay, do you want to go ahead and read that? That's 42, 42 bowl. Oh, that's the only one I saw from Harleston. From the Carlson Village Association. I don't see one for 115. Um, yeah, I don't have one either. Carlson neighborhood. Hmm. Let me look in a couple other places. Um, they may have submitted it late. Um, as you know, we adjusted our submittal for public comment to the day before the meeting. So if they submitted it after yesterday at noon, it might not have gotten into our folder. And we know there is one, Julia. Um, I think that the Preservation Society referenced it. Well, while we're waiting for that, just to clarify, we're not really reviewing or considering what we're looking at on the screen here, the wall or the hardscaping or the landscaping, any of that, right? That's just sort of for reference, general thoughts. Yes, at the last meeting, um, the applicant had been asked for, you know, an idea of what they may propose to go in. General and idea. Okay. Yeah. I was under the impression, excuse me, this is Kim. I was under the impression that this is going to be constructed. Is that not the case, Simmons? Uh, this, this is the plan to construct this. But it's not part of the, the request. It's correct. Uh, my understanding is it's not part of the requirement. So I guess we would have to come back to um, the order of request this. That's, and that's why I was asking for clarification. Gotcha. And Kim, this would not be a staff level. Would, would this come before the board or would it be a staff level approval, the hardscaping plan? Well, you could either approve the demolition um, contingent upon this, approve them at the same time, or you could say approval with um, a final review by staff for the landscaping. You do it however you like. Does not have to come back to the board. Uh, okay. Does that answer your question? We're in, we're in staff and we're in board discussion now, right? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, I'll just say that while I hear what Preservation Society is saying about the void and the streetscape, 
I do believe that the applicant has made a good case and a clear detailed case for why um, this building can be justifiably demolished. Um, and I believe he's correct that we need to review that without necessarily thinking of what might replace it or might not replace it. So I am in agreement with staff that it is reasonable for this building to be demolished. And I think that because the request was simply for demolition, I don't feel the need to reference the landscaping or hardscaping. And if that can be dealt with by staff later, that's fine by me. I'm in agreement with Julia and, and I really don't have anything to add. I'll be brief. I'm in agreement with Julia as well. I, I was at the site meeting this morning and uh, I, I don't think Mr. Simmons could have made a better case. Um, the, the building doesn't have any true sense of uh, architectural merits, be it components, uh, materials, uh, otherwise, and certainly not structurally. Um, and, and I do think it sets a bad precedent to uh, uh, judge something, albeit we may not want a parking lot or make sure that it's done well, but, but that, that to, to deny something solely because of what you anticipate may follow. Um, that, that, that's not uh, within our purview or ability to do so. So I th think that's not the right, right approach. Um, so I, I would support demolition of this um, and the, the, the whatever comes could be reviewed by staff after. Can it still more with us? Can't tell. I think he's still having issues. I've promoted him to a panelist, but I don't think his computer is working. All right, well, I'll make a motion for um, final approval. We have a motion on the floor for final approval. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Eddie. And I'll put it to a vote. Julia? Um, Lindsay, will you just clarify final approval of demolition? Final approval, yes. We have a, the motion is for final approval of demolition. So we are not commenting on the hard state plan. Agreed. Um, Eddie, does your second that motion still stand? Absolutely, thank you. Okay, and, um, and Fillmore is not able to unmute. Okay. All right, I'll put it to a vote, Julia. Yay in favor. Eddie? Yay in favor. Chair votes with the majority uh, and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number two is 12 King Street. Kim, can you give us an introduction and overview of this project? Certainly, just give me one moment. Is there a phone number that Fillmore can dial into? I know we have a quorum, but I would hate for him to. Um, if he wanted to say something. Yes. I just suggested that he try it. Okay, agenda item number two is 12 King Street. It's requesting conceptual approval for modifications to the west elevation, including the entry steps, removal of brick veneer, and new construction of a single story porch. The building's category four in the Charlestown neighborhood. It was built in 1897 in the old and historic district. And uh, here's an aerial for context. It's on the south side of uh, Lambole Street at King. And some existing site photos. And this is looking southeast. Looking north on King and looking south. And east on Lamble. Here are the Sandbor maps from 1902 and 1955, both showing a different building. We found some newspaper articles um, in the September 5th, 1887, um, 
News and Courier, page one, it was permit obtained by Virginia Coster, um, the wood building, $700. And then again, September 11th, 1897, News and Courier, page nine, um, C.E. Brooks, 12 King Street, two-story frame building, $1,500. And with that said, I will turn it over to Mr. David Richard. Richards, you have the floor whenever you're ready. Mr. Richard, you're on mute. Is that, did that turn off the mute? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, yes, uh, nice to speak with you all this evening. I appreciate your time. Um, I will ask that you flip over to the second sheet, CS2, Kim, and I can sort of describe the uh, residence. So the house, as Kim just stated, was built, you know, let's just say around 1887. Um, there was a house on this property prior to that, that as the sandbar map shows, uh, went all the way to King Street. This building is recessed from King Street, uh, roughly 17, 18 feet or so. Um, it was a Victorian structure, as you see from the, the turret on the corner there on the, north, on the south uh, west corner of the, the, the house, uh, two-story wood frame structure, masonry chimneys. At some point in time in, we believe, around the 1970s, uh, for some reason, unbeknownst to me, and it doesn't hardly make any sense, they removed the, the, the brick or the wood siding in front of the building and installed this brick uh, bay window and brick facade on the north elevation. So that's, none of that is historic in nature. It's all salvaged brick uh, and, and obviously and clearly does not uh, align with the vernacular Victorian architecture of the rest of the house. It's, it's very odd looking <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and it really has no, doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason. Obviously expensive pro pro project and really detract from the value of the house altogether. So uh, sort of a strange uh, circumstance. Um, Kim, I'm gonna ask you to go to two sheets beyond this, to CS4. This is the streetscape. And as Kim pointed out in her, her uh, photos, all the houses, practically all the houses on King Street come right up to the, to the King, to the, to the sidewalk on King on both the east and west elevation. This house uh, being a later date than most of the others for some reason was recessed. Um, it had a, had a front porch on it um, at, at one point in time. Um, I, I assume the porches were, were moved when that brick elevation was, was, uh, was put on. If you could go to the next sheet, a101, I can walk you through the plans. So existing first floor on the lower left with the brick uh, cavity wall, bay window. Uh, I've been underneath the house and you can see where the original house, the sill of the original house clearly aligned with that as it is on the second floor. So, uh, so this bay was added. Uh, you have sort of st strange brick uh, stairs coming down from the front door and some sort of odd land brick landscaping around the front, the front yard. Um, second floor basically as is, is exists as it, it always has. Um, so our proposal here is to, to rework the front stairs so that they're more grand and ascend, descend from a landing, a larger, deeper landing and ascend towards the front yard. Uh, create sort of a nice little patio area up there and, and rework uh, the, the paving such that it's, you know, much more attractive. Stone pa paving is our preference. Um, the porch uh, is, is 10, roughly 10 feet, uh, 11 feet uh, in depth uh, and aligns and, you know, is inset, you know, roughly 16 inches from each corner of the projecting existing, well, what would have been existing uh, 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 primary portion of the house. 
uh, second floor there you, you see the the roof of, the, of that hip structure very delicate but it brings the the deeper porch brings it more in alignment with the other houses on king street we do still have some some landscaped area in front of the porch but uh, it's closer to what the other houses are so next sheet kim sheet 201 is the front elevations so there's the existing structure with the obviously beautiful Victorian structure and, and wonderful uh, turret on the corner there. Um, and then the crazy brick. So our new design is a, a, a hip uh, roof porch uh, and rework in the stairs uh, on the, on the right hand side, on the South side. So it's a very comfortable and, and I think uh, appropriate design uh for for this property uh next page is the south elevation you see the stairs uh, with a larger landing deeper landing we keep the front entrance uh of portico uh there at, it, it looks to be original but uh, you know i can't say with certainty that that's the case but it looks it looks as though it was um some sort of more uh, period appropriate uh pickets there uh, stone uh, treads and, and then a cap on the on the uh, landing, uh, but and then a brick uh, foundation for that. You see the uh, the porch in the, the in the background there. Next sheet shows the uh, the porch from the uh, north elevation. Uh, at this point in time, the owners want to retain the the brick on that north elevation. Um, we're certainly making a step in the right direction by recladding as much as we, uh, you know, at least improving it from the, uh, from the West side. Uh, and, uh, but for now, uh, the brick is to be retained on, on the, the balance of the, on the North elevation. Um, next page, CS4. One of the ideas and, and very important aspects of this project was that the, the owners really have no other area on site to gather. Uh, there's no rear porch. In fact, the driveway comes right up practically to their back door. Uh, they have a little sidewalk on the south ele elevation of the property, but no really potential to, to gather there. So they felt it was, it was not too much to ask to have a sort of a deeper, a deeper porch that you know, more than two people could, could sit on. So uh, the elevation or the plans up there show that it's 10 feet, which is not particularly unusual, um, but it gives them a nice, uh, comfortable working porch. I think of all of these photographs that sh show the sort of the more comfortable, deeper porches, the, probably the one on the upper right with a very happy dog there um, is probably the dimension we're, we're looking at. That, that feels about like it's 10 feet, which is about where we're at. So um, next sheet. Um, so here are some, uh, some structures and other homes in Charleston that, that have some of the features that we're looking at. The upper left is a Victorian built roughly at the same time. It actually happens to be my home, but uh, they've got the porch on the left-hand side, the turret on the right, and a, 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 um, a set of stairs uh, you know, off, out of the front door, descending down to, towards the street. Uh, the other photos here on the right-hand side of this, this sheet are deep porches, uh, which is not atypical in Charleston. Uh, I know many of them are, are shallow for smaller homes, but uh, uh, deeper porches are, you know, have plenty of precedent in Charleston. The photo on the lower left is actually a home just almost practically across the street um, that has is probably relatively from the same time period as, as, as 12 King with a porch in the center off of the main bay of the, of the house, and then a separate set of stairs ascending you know, to the right of that in that image. Um, next image, please. This was a uh, uh, photo of, uh, that Kim had sent me. She said, perhaps maybe this is something you should consider. Uh, a single porch across the, the entire front elevation uh, I know the Sanborn map 
had a dashed line there that, that could have represented something like this, but I don't quite frankly know how that could have been possible. Um, with, at least with a, the porch that's over six feet. So as it's diagrammed here, the porch, the stairs ascend from the front of the, of the porch, as is in a photograph. If we do that with the porch that we had hoped to have, the 11 foot deep porch, obviously the stairs head into the front wall. So that's not a workable solution. So the farther you move those stairs back, the shallower and shallower that porch becomes. And frankly, a little bit out of proportion, I think, and certainly not what the owners had in mind. Um, and uh, it, was it was not what they had hoped um, to have. So uh, what we feel we pr uh, propose here is a vast improvement from what exists today, uh, returning this house to some semblance of its former glory, uh, giving the owners a, a more comfortable porch to, to gather in. in and uh, feels very, very appropriate to this house. The, the, if you look back to the elevation, um, let's just go all the way to CS4, I'll sort of conclude it here. Uh, if you can. Uh, one more page, CS4, next page. There you go. So the, the house uh, has a very nice balance to it. Uh, the, the entrance stair on the right sort of aligns with the, with the uh, turret above and has a nice balance to it. And the, and the new porch, a standalone porch that is separated from the stairs, feels comfortable uh, you know, in that larger body of the, of the main wing of the house, main body of the house. It feels comfortable. Obviously, we work. We'll work with this with the city on, you know, fine tuning the details. Um, but we think this is appropriate design, and, and we hope you'll agree that it's an improvement and over what is there now. Uh, I know the owners, Bonnie and Gordon, are on the call. I think they may have a thing or two to say about their perspective. Mr. Richards, we are out of time at, at this point. Um, do we have any uh, board questions for the applicant? Um, sure. Um, can you just explain what is meant on some of the material callouts where you say historic metal roofing, historic standing seam roofing for the new porch yeah, roof? For the, in respect to the roof, I guess a state hand turned standing seam roof. Like copper, or what are you thinking? Um, well, copper seems to be the most available these days, so uh, it's not out of the question that that could be copper. Um, okay. You're thinking something to to um, something similar to turn metal, right? That's where you're going. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. And um, the age of the wall and the gate at the front. Do you have any indication of that? Say that again, I'm sorry. The wall and the gate at the front. Do you have any indication I, you of that? You know, age? I don't. I don't. Kim may have some insight into that. Uh, I expect this the way that it's detailed and ties into the, uh, to the corner of the main house that it was built in the 1970s. But I, I don't know, Kim, Kim may have some insight. I, I, don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, I don't have any. It's, it's a nice brick wall and we intend to retain it. Thank you. Do we have any other board questions at this time? Right, no ma'am. All right, Kim, let's move on to public comment. I think we have Fillmore. Fillmore, can you try to unmute yourself? Fillmore, the 717 number? Yes. Um, in the meantime, we have uh, Aaron Minigan speaking. 
Thanks, Kim. Erin uh, Menigan with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out to us on this request. We are generally supportive of the reintroduction of a porch on the front elevation as an improvement to the existing condition, but would prefer the alternate design approach 2B shown on page A903, which seems to most, most closely match, match the propo proportion, excuse me, of the full width porch shown on the 1902 Sanborn map. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Let's have April Wood. April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has reviewed the request for conceptual approval for modifications to the front elevation, including removal of brick veneer and new construction of a one-story porch. We are in support of this application and recommend approval for the project. Thank you. Hey, Kim, I believe that's it for public comment, right? Yes. Okay, if you'll give us city staff comments and recommendations, please. Thank you. We're pleased to see plans to remove the brick on the front of the building. We would urge the owner and applicant to remove the entirety of it. We're generally in favor and commend the owner and architect for their efforts. The porch depth is atypical for the house of modest scale and the depth should relate more closely to its original footprint on the Sanborn map. While the Sanborn map shows a slender porch, we would be comfortable with more or less six feet. The separation of porch and stoop creates an overly complex entry. We feel that these elements should be combined as one unit to simplify the facade. Staff has discussed using the Victorian sister houses on Church Street for guidance of design on the front porch and stoop with the applicant, and we are pleased to see the study done for that. These houses are 93 to 99 Church Street. Perhaps a, the stair would need to be slightly inset from the edge of the porch if a six foot depth is used. An additional column should be added to the center of the porch for more vertical proportions. The traditional, excuse me, the triple column configuration is possibly the architect's attempt to mitigate this imbalance, but we feel the use of singular columns and three bays would successfully balance proportions. So the staff's recommending conceptual approval with staff comments and final review by staff. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Mr. Richards, did you want to respond or clarify anything raised during public comment or uh, staff comments? Uh, yes, yes, I would. Um, as to uh, Kim's comments, uh, I, I think I just heard her say that she'd prefer a column in the center of, the, of that porch, which seems uh, to me to be visually uh, uh, inappropriate. I mean, it divide the porch into half. Uh, we like the double columns. It's a vic common Victorian element. Uh, it gives it a little bit of interest, uh, a little bit of unique character. Uh, we're not trying to, uh, you know, build something that may or may not have been a, uh, existed. You know, we, who's to say that that Sanborn map is actually exactly correct? We don't know that. We have no indication uh, of that. We feel that this porch design that we have is very, very appropriate to the house. Gives the owner a, a, a more comfortable working porch than a six foot porch, which yeah, I frankly, I don't know if they do the project, if that, that is what they're left with. Um, we feel it's a very, very appropriate design. We think we like the separation of the stair from the, the porch. The owners do not want to have uh, potential people getting, you know, walking up their stairs and onto their porch. They wanted that porch to be a private zone uh, with some security to it. Uh, so, uh, we are very, very comfortable with our submittal. I think we've worked closely with the Historic Charleston Foundation and, and they agree that that's, this is appropriate. Uh, I think there's very big, some big issues uh, with the plan B that was, that the city had was sort of pushing. Um, I think it cramps the, the stairs come all the way to the front and if you inset them, that's a problem. Um, it's not what the, it doesn't align with the image that she sent us. I tried to show that in, in various diagrams uh, to the city, but we feel very strongly that this is uh, a perfectly appropriate house in terms of our design, in terms of Victorian architecture, and, and it meets the client's uh, needs and aspirations. Uh, uh, we're very happy with the design, and I think many that ever have looked at it also agree. Thank you, Mr. Richards. We'll move into board uh, discussion and a vote at this point, but um, technical break. Fillmore, if you can hear me, 
uh, dial star six on your phone. It should unmute him. Maybe not. We can we can go into more board discussion and out of my. He probably went to go eat dinner. <laughs> or maybe Star Six hangs you up. I, I've never used it, but okay. We'll proceed. Um, I'll I'll go ahead and start. Um, yeah, I think it, it would be helpful to me if we had a site plan. I mean, I. I believe the applicant that there's very limited um, outdoor space on at the rear of the house, and it, it, it just would be helpful if we could actually see that on the site plan. Um, but I'll admit that I'm sort of torn on this one. Um, I understand that they're trying to, to create a meaningful living space outdoors. Um, I appreciate what they're doing with the removal of the brick. And I also appreciate that that door surround that somehow happened in the horrible decade of the 70s is, is kind of nice. Um, so I'm not totally opposed to, to the concept that they are presenting. Maybe the depth that they're presenting could be tempered a little bit. Um, I think that's kind of where I'm Standing, but I'm really curious to hear what other people have to say. Julian, looking at it, I, I tend to agree. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough problem. I think Mr. Richards has made a good case and I go by that building quite often walking uh, King Street and otherwise. So I at least uh, don't disagree that cycling would be helpful, but that the space at the rear is extremely limited. So they're really only usable space is, is that front area, be it for green space and or porch. Um, and uh, for better or worse, my, my parents lived in one of those houses that Kim referenced on Church Street. And that porch is sweet and it's, it's a nice element. And I looked at it as the alternative design, um, but do see the problems it could potentially uh, present to the applicant, not the least of which was maybe where you were going with it, how old is the wall, if that, that gets reworked and then the entry allows somebody to go in, but, but still doesn't present them a porch step that they need. Um, but, but all that said, uh, I, I, I guess I, I, I would land on the fact that it is a, kind of a, a quirky house, needless to say, to begin with, and, and uh, the improvement to the King Street facade with the uh, siding and the French doors um, is 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 definitely a good one, and and I'd say it's it's certainly better than what what is there presently. I guess my uh, summation comment would be that I don't disagree with you, and respectfully, Mr. Richards and the client. If there was a way to just mitigate that porch depth a, a foot or so, I mean, just it, it, it does feel a little proportionally on the side larger than what uh, would typically be on something of this nature. I don't know that it would have to go back to where Sanborn was, but if there was a way to reduce that depth just somewhat, um, and maybe there's some kind of happy medium that, that that would be satisfactory. Eddie, can I ask you if you have any thoughts about the column in the center versus the double columns at the ends? Uh, let me look real quick at that. You know, I, I mean, I think in some of those, in, in some of the case studies, Mr. Richard showed that, that that makes sense. This one, it feels obviously like it's a, it's a newer interpretation and, and, and whatnot that um, I, I'm okay with it as he presented it with, with this design. Uh, Fillmore's still not with us, right, Lindsay? No, it looks like he's mute. he was unmuted briefly, and now he's he's muted again. Oh. Um, well, while we give him a moment, I I tend to agree with you all on, on your comments. Um, I, I really would like to see um, something done with with this removing the the brick veneer. I think is a great improvement. I do understand um, the owner's concern about 
creating a, a creating a space for themselves and, and not having a, a, an access point um, that someone could walk up to this area. Um, so I, I'm okay not incorporating that into the design. And I, I do think that there's probably a happy medium here. I, I think uh, what Eddie said, just if you could take a foot or two off of that depth, um, I think this would be really nice. I, I do under I do understand what the owners are saying that with a six foot porch, it's maybe not um, creating the space that they wanted, but I think there's a happy medium there. Okay. Um, so I could go ahead and try to make a motion. Um, I'll make a motion for conceptual approval. With staff comment number one and board comments to reduce the depth of the porch approximately 18 inches and to um, to carefully study proportions of the new fenestration and final review by staff. Sorry, that last thing was out of left field, but it just the, the, the light patterns on the French doors, I don't know, I think they might benefit from a little study. So I threw that in, if anybody will take the bait. Okay, we have a motion on the floor for conceptual approval with staff comment one. A and a board comment to reduce the depth of the porch by approximately 18 inches and to carefully study the proportions of the new fenestration and final review by staff. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second that as stated. Ready? And I'll put it to a vote. I have some more. Julia? Yay in favor. Eddie? Yay in favor. And the chair of the majority and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number three, 127 Smith Street. Kim, please provide an introduction and overview of this project. Thank you, Lindsay. Just give me one moment. Okay. Hey there, guys. Um, am I? 127 am I Smith. Oh, you, hold you on, are. just one moment. 127 Smith Street is requesting conceptual approval for the new construction of a single family residence. It's in Radcliffe Borough neighborhood and the old and historic district. So, Kim, I'm actually going to pass this to Mark Ragobudu, who is on the phone as well. And Mr. Allison, um, we're going through the staff uh, overview portion right now. So in just oh, a moment, it'll be your turn. Sure. So this is an aerial uh, just showing you where it is in the city just south of Vanderoff Street. And some existing site photos. You can see that the property is next to the pink house and, and inside the fence. Additional photos. Looking from the north side, looking south on Smith, and looking north on Smith. Here's the 1888 Sanborn map. Shows the building, 1902 and 1944. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Mr. Rigobito. Thank you very much. My name is Mark Rigobito with Renew Urban. Um, I'm only going to present the, the first part um, after this, and specifically to the existing plat and how this plat came to be, uh, and then turn it over to um, David McCall, the architect. 
Kim, would you be so kind to go back to the first site photo that you presented, which was essentially a straight on view. So when, when. And what would you like to see, Mark? Um, the, the first site photo that you showed in your slide, which essentially just showed the front of the lot with the trees and the street, right? One, keep going. One more, I think. One more. There you go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so um, when this house and when, when the pink house uh, came up for sale, it came up for sale with a package of both the house and the lot. And I think um, all of you on the board have a trained eye and probably the first thing you see here is that the organization orientation of the porch is on the wrong side of the house um, based on the historic Charleston pattern. And that's really because the house was, was moved there and, and, and it was put in that position. Um, it just so happened that um, we had a number of zoning obstacles to get through before we came to you. And I think it's important that you know what the members of the community said to us prior to coming to you and how we came to this lot. Um, it happened that Lee Batchelder used to live directly behind this and personally planted some of the trees that you see here on the streetscape and was part of some, a neighborhood group that planted these trees. So, very, very simply, the lot prior to the existing plat that you see here, can we go to that plat now, Kim, was, was much smaller and posed a number of problems uh, for the construction um, of, 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 of any home. And you can see what that original plat was based on the dotted line, and you can then see where, with the support of the community and the zoning board, we enlarged the lot, the lot. The thought behind it was a simple one, that um, the, the organization of the, of the pink house is, is incorrect. Um, it kind of throws off the neighborhood pattern and that what we wanted to do was kind of reestablish some organization uh, there and give a bit more of a generous lot to the newer home uh, to, to, to promote a really nice home there. In talking with the neighbors, and the only reason I know Lee Batchelder personally helped plant those trees is none of the neighbors wanted to create a new curb cut, which would do a number of things, destroy the trees and, uh, uh, and reduce the number of parking on the street, which they very much do not want. So it, by enlarging the lot, uh, understanding that the, the, the pink house is a little bit of an oddity. Um, everybody liked the idea of, of essentially enlarging the curb cut to uh, 129 Smith and loading the driveway um, to the north of 120 Smith Street. Um, because again, the, the neighborhood pattern has already been disrupted and they didn't like the results of the curb cut. So it was with, with that thinking that we enlarged the lot and the design you see has the curb cut and the loading of this house to the north. And again, that was driven by overwhelming, you know, neighbor and community desire to do that and not lose the parking. So that's how we came to the lot that you see here. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the architect because obviously I'm not an architect, and he's going to talk about the architectural details of the house. David? I see him at the meeting and he's not muted. He was having some audio issues. I'm making sure that he's in and can hear us. Our apologies. I'm gonna try promoting him to panelist. See if that will help. Thank you, Kim.
Okay, it appears he can hear us, but he's going to call back in because we can't hear him. Apologies. Uh -huh. While we're waiting, I see that we have Fillmore in, and he appears to be unmuted. Fillmore, I am. Lindsay, am I unmuted? Fillmore, oh, we okay. welcome. <laughs> I, have, I have no video, and uh, but I think I finally managed to get uh, get myself unmuted without the program going haywire. Fillmore, thank you for the effort you made. <laughs> Modern technology. Okay, I see a, a caller and it's muted. Google says the trick for unmuting a phone is star six, but I don't know if that worked for film or Oh, oh, oh. Did that work? Did that work? Did that work? Did that work? It's good, but it's not I think you need to mute your computer. computer. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can hear you. Okay. I think uh, in talking about the architecture uh, regarding the exterior appearance, there's not a, can I be heard? Am I being heard? Yes, you are. Okay. There's not a repetitious historic style to conform to on this block of Smith Street. As one will see, the streetscape has a broad range of building types. If you uh, can sh show the, uh, the, the frame with the, the, the local houses. Our style is conducive to the historic Charleston using the current use of materials with a acceptable historic vernacular. Our materials and application of materials on the exterior are traditional. The roof will be a crimped metal roofing. The body of the house will be a combination of lap, lap siding and board and batten with a brick foundation. The colors that we will choose will be in harmony with the historic examples. We've taken into account the structure's relationship to the street. The entry stairs would be have a, a Charleston style metal rail system. A foundation would be accentuated with historic style brick arches. Um, our dormers building body and foundation adopt a historic penetration pattern that would be, we think, harmonious asset to the area. Uh, I don't know. Is there a staff report that you, you're supposed to read? Um, yes, oh. Mr. McCall, we'll do so uh, later in the meeting when um, Kim gives, or later in this presentation, when Kim gives the city staff comments and recommendations. So if, if you okay. want to do your presentation now on the design, and then we'll follow up with some some board questions if there are any, and, um, and a little bit move on to the well, staff comments. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to know what the issues of the of of accepting it or denying it are. To, to I think I've had all I to say that I have to say about the architecture. Okay, um, there is about uh, four minutes left in the in your applicant presentation. So if anyone else from the applicant side um, wants to say anything else, note that you'll also have five minutes after um, city staff comments and recommendations and public comment to respond as well. But I wanted to give you the four remaining minutes if you want to um, use those for anything else. Well, the, the, go back to the previous picture, if you would. That, the style and the sort of a contemporary Charleston look, I think would look good in the area. Go to the next slide. You can see the streetscape, the height of the building in the middle is, is our building. 
the buildings on either side are across the street from our building. Yeah, another slide. This right here is the height of the building with the two adjacent residences on either side. Uh, go ahead. If it, you can see what we think is a really attractive building that, that's approximately 24 by 40 feet. So it's not much, you know, a single story is not much more than a double wide. It's not a large, uh, you know, 24 by 40 is not a uh, overwhelmingly large structure. We, we were gonna make it bigger, but decided to be more in context with the surrounding buildings we would reduce the size of the footprint. Next. Can you go to the next slide? Do you have the, the slide of the uh, uh, houses on the street? Colored photograph? Photographs, yes. Yeah. About... Yeah, right. Uh, Right there, if you look at that, the yellow house, go, go back. The, the house on the left frame, you see a, a residential uh, apartment building across the street from us and the height is, is uh, quite up there. But the, the picture that you see with the black car in the front of, of the street, that is the, the height of the building that we're proposing and these, this is Smith Street, and there's numerous homes on Smith Street with that scale. All right. We'll go to the next slide. You've got about a minute left, Mr. McCall. Um, well, I think I'm good. I'm ready to move on. Okay. Uh, do my fellow board members have any questions for uh, the applicant? Um, I do. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you're Sorry. Right. Okay. Um, it, was there a proposed site plan? And maybe I just missed that or sorry, or showed, but I, I, I just pulled up the advantage of Zoom, I guess, the Google Earth, just to look at that area. I, I know there was mention of the fact trying to use that same driveway and, and a curb cut. Um, but it looked like from the partial site plan, I guess, or, or, or what that, that uh, maybe it, it, it did expand it. Can you zoom in on that? Yes, sir. And I, I can see that. But I guess question for me that is that that's expanding based on the, the current driveway for 129 Smith is all on the property of 129 Smith or was that property line adjusted as well? That property line was not adjusted. You are uh -huh. correct that this organization would require that we expand the curb cut. Yes. And create a rollover catch basin. There is a squared standard catch basin there now, and we would have to put a, a rollover basin. Yep, you see it right there. Mm -hmm. um, but that we, under that scenario, I had just enough to load the car in and then kind of angle it in and save the trees and the parking. Okay. Okay, that, that, that was my question. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. McCullough. Um, could you clarify kind of the vertical dimensions? Because at one point it seems to indicate that there's a, it looks like in your building section, like the first floor framing is two by 12, which would be really typical. But then up above that on the elevation, there's a note about 24 inches for the floor structure there below. The first floor, and I'm just curious yeah. um, if you can explain that. Uh, we have two uh, two by six stud walls, and uh, not with not having any interior load bearing walls, we made this. this a, since it's about a 24 foot span, we can do that with a uh, 24 inch floor joist system, and that's what we're doing. But I mean, in theory, you could have. You could have peers in the center, right? That would kind of be more typical. Well, I, 
Well, we have, if you, the floor plan is a lot of wide open space with long spans. And instead of doing a number of beams, we just went with a thicker uh, uh, joist system that can make the span. And those will be pressure treated, I guess? Well, no. The, the, are you talking about the first floor? The first the floor, floor, yeah, or? yeah, just the very first floor. Okay. Where at the bottom, at your at your building section yeah. on the bottom of that page, it indicates yeah. two by twelves. Yeah. Right. We would probably uh, this is conceptual submittal, but uh, we we would absolutely hire a structural engineer. Sure. But oh, there you go. Go I back one, Ken. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was just asking, and it's not because I'm pinning you down to some specific structural thing. It's just, a, it, it um, has an effect on some of the zoning requirements. Thank you. Right. Do we have any other board questions at this time? All right. Um, Kim, we'll move on to public comment. We have Aaron Minigan speaking. Thank you, Erin uh, Minigan with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society is concerned with the height, scale, mass, and architectural direction of this proposal. As depicted on the streetscape elevation, the house is significantly out of scale with the neighboring properties and will tower over the buildings on the streetscape. The wide building footprint and steeply pitched roof should be reduced to mitigate significant issues of height and scale. Further, the asymmetrical and inconsistent fenestration pattern is jarring and unrelated to the neighborhood character. Therefore, we urge full restudy of these areas to facilitate a design that is more appropriately, more appropriately responding to the context. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Can I, can I we comment We also on have that? April Wood. Mr. McCall, you'll have um, a, a period after public comments and staff comments to respond. Okay. Uh, this is a April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has reviewed the request for conceptual approval for the new construction of a single family residence. We have concerns about height, scale, and mass of the proposed structure, as well as the architectural direction. Regarding the height, scale, and mass, we believe the structure is too tall compared to the adjacent properties. The appearance of the height may be reduced by reducing the floor to ceiling heights, adjusting the pitch of the roof, reducing the vertical proportions of the windows on the front elevation, and eliminating the projecting portion on the front elevation, which has a strong vertical emphasis. We also have concerns about the architectural direction, especially on the front design. It appears that multiple architectural styles are represented on this elevation. The front facade should be simplified to better fit into the context of the neighborhood. We suggest restudying the projecting portions of the front elevation, the detailing of the front porch, and the inconsistent window patterns and placement. We respectfully recommend deferral of this application so that these issues can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, April. And Kim, can you confirm that we have no other public comment? Yes, that's all. Okay, if you will provide city staff comments and recommendations, please. I will, thank you, Lindsay. All right, staff was glad to have the opportunity to meet with the owner and architect on this proposal, but unfortunately the feedback was not incorporated. The design of the building is atypical to the streetscape and surrounding neighborhood and that of Charleston in general. We are certainly not opposed to contemporary design, but the streetscape rhythm and building patterns of the city should be maintained. The height, scale, and mass of the proposal dwarfs its neighbors and is not appropriate. We believe the siting should be reversed so that the driveway and any porch or entry element should be south facing with the rest of the street and for historic context as well. The zoning variance was granted to reverse the setbacks at the request of the applicant, but we feel that the south facing driveway should be maintained. Per ordinance, any area underneath the structure in excess of six feet should be counted as one story. This is provided that the building has a typical floor structure and a two foot floor system is not typical. 
nor is it drawn as such in any of the building sections in the set. The building does not meet zoning requirement, requirements laid forth for height district um, two and a half to three story. And this height district has a maximum of three stories and there's no opportunity to be granted an additional half story by the BAR. This is section 54-306C item two. Additionally, the height district also requires the building to be limited by the right of way width of the street at a maximum of one to one, i.e. if the right of way is 40 feet, the building shall not be any taller than 40 feet. The right of way on Smith Street is 45 feet and this proposal exceeds this. Aside from all these technical requirements, the proposed design does not meet Charleston principles or standards, and so staff's recommending denial for height, scale, mass, general architectural design, and zoning conformity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCall, at this time, uh, you all have a five-minute period to um, clarify or respond to anything raised in uh, public comment or by the city staff comments. Well, um, I guess I'll start <clears throat> with the uh, foundation situation where she, I guess, thinks staff is implying that we exceed six feet. We do have a two foot free board and, and our structure above the crawl space cannot exceed six feet or you aren't allowed a two and a half story building. The flood zone is an AE 11. Our grade sidewalk elevation is 5.4, which gives us a 5.6 distance from grade to the bottom of the structure. This is less than the allowed six feet. A for, the formula that I used is uh, AE11 minus five foot four equals 5.6, less than the allowed six feet and is not counted as a story. Number five in the ordinance says that any area under a structure in excess of six feet shall be counted as a story, and we are less than six feet. Um, the height of the building, the, the residence is in a two and a half story district. I believe we passed all the requirements for that. The issues that were faced for this design was how the two and a half story structure would deal with the FEMA requirements meet the code requirements and maintain a streetscape scale. I will address the building height since this issue has a huge impact on the streetscape. Our grade elevation is 5.4, mean sea level. FEMA zone is AE11. Our finished floor elevation is required to be a minimum 13 feet MSL, mean sea level. That means our first floor will appear to be approximately eight feet higher than grade and the adjacent structures. There is nothing we can do about that. It is a FEMA requirement. Although the height aligns with many buildings nearby on Smith Street and across the street, this height is not aligned with adjacent buildings, which have not been raised to meet the flood requirements. If you view the photos and other buildings on Smith Creek, our building fits the landscape with regards to height. Let's talk about the pink house. The pink house to our left should not be considered in determining the streetscape. The pink house was delivered by house movers and I believe the first floor was not raised to its original height. The entire original foundation wall and crawl space height was eliminated and, it, and its proximity to the street was abandoned. It certainly does not meet FEMA or city flood requirements. In fact, the elevation certificate issued this past December places the first floor of the pink house at 5.7 feet MSL, MSL. The pink house has no crawl space. So in my opinion, we really should not consider the pink house in context to height and streetscape. The greenhouse on the right-hand side is a two-story house that does not meet the FEMA or city flood standards. I ask you to keep in mind that the greenhouse was originally a lower income dwelling that now shows fatigue. This house will eventually be renovated. And as most houses in this category will be, will be improved over 50% of its value, which means this house will have to be brought up to code and FEMA requirements. Its foundation will be raised the same as our house. 
once it is renovated and raised, it could be considered a two and a half story house. The point is, in time, our height will be the norm on Smith Street. We are among the first to design and build a house on this block dealing with the new FEMA and city requirements adopted in January. Our house can meet all code requirements for a two and a half story house. Only the subjective decision, whether valid or not, might disqualify us due to height. I am saying with the new flood standards, all the homes on Smith Street will eventually increase in height similar to ours. Our height is as someone mentioned about lowering ceiling heights and such. Well, our height is as low as reasonable, and here's why. We dealt with the FEMA requirements and increased the first floor to a 13 elevation. We used the standard first floor ceiling height of 10 feet and a standard second floor ceiling height of nine feet. Our roof framing for the half story is bearing on a three inch high plate, even though 24 inches is allowed. So our design is at the minimum vertical eave height that is practical and normal in Charleston. Section 54-306, the city, old city height district ordinance, it says that it is the right of the bar to adjust heights in limits in limited circumstances when based on architectural merit and context. We believe we are the first to face these issues and this house will be viewed in a more favorable light as time moves forward when the same standards are applied and met by neighboring houses. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. McCall. All right, let's move into board discussion and a vote. And, and just to note without commenting on whether there is a zoning issue or not, but I think if, um, if our decision is any form of approval, um, there just needs to be, I think, incorporated a condition that we confirm there are no zoning issues. Uh, and with that, um, let's open it up and Okay, I'll, I'll begin. This is uh, Eddie Fela. Um, I, I uh, am familiar with that area because my first home was on Talon Court, um, right to the rear of this property. Uh, so, so, so know it well. Um, and, and for the applicant's uh, statements and whatnot, it, it, it has always had a tendency to flood. And, and personally, zoning issue or not, um, that that's not necessarily what's driving driving my comments. I guess uh, there there have been references to the the neighborhood pattern and and things of that nature, but respectfully, it seems to me the the irony is if it, if it had almost stayed the same size lot, the neighborhood pattern would have dictated a house that would be a little bit more small, a little smaller, uh, perhaps, um, and and a more appropriate scale. Um, and uh, uh, that that that. I, I guess is of some concern. Um, and and the, the scale, again, d does seem off. And, and I understand Mr. McCall's statements about the fact that if these are raised to accommodate FEMA, but, but even the elements that we've all noted, the height, scale, mass, and general architectural direction seem off for this, this side of the street, not only for its location, but for uh, the size of the lot it's on. If, if there was more space around it or more, uh, that may dictate otherwise. And some of the things that are across the street, um, needless to say, are obviously very different buildings. There are apartment buildings and, and multiple residences. Um, and, and, you know, even in looking at uh, the, the, the sheet A2, and I'm sorry, I'm looking above the screen that y'all have on, online just for, for double reference, but um, where, where we've got the pink house and the other house. And again, respectfully understanding that, yes, those may be items that are raised, but even in doing so, I, I think have a, have a better sense of scale um, than, than what, what is, what is shown presently. So I, I do have reservations for it. I, I understand the effort that's gone into it and with the adjustment of the property line and all of those, but I don't know if it wouldn't have been better if that didn't happen or, or uh, uh, just a, a serious reconsideration of what's being proposed because it does seem to kind of overwhelm 
what's there presently and, and even looking forward to what may happen to those homes would, would, would still do so and seem uh, uh, incompatible. Um, I think that was well, well put, Eddie. Um, you know, I am, and I think we all are sympathetic to the challenges of designing a new structure within the, all of the parameters and regulations that are in place right now, um, and it's not easy. Um, but it, it can be done. And personally, I'm all for contemporary you know, interpretations of traditional Charleston forms. I have no problem with asymmetry as a general notion, um, but I just, I just don't, I, yeah, this particular design is just tough for me to bond with in this particular context on this size lot. I do appreciate uh, Mark Rigobuto explaining the evolution of how the site's laid out and, and I can understand that and that I accept that and that's what the city and the neighborhood um, really wanted. But the design of the house itself is just, um, it seems to me foreign in a number of ways. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't wanna pick it apart because it's more of a holistic issue for me. It's just um, that the height, scale, and mass are, are not appropriate here. And, uh, and the general architectural direction is just, it, it's tough to follow. Right now, it seems sort of haphazard. And maybe this, this house and this design have a place somewhere. I'm not saying it's a terrible design at all, but the, the place for it is, I just don't think is right here. Fillmore Wilson here. Am I still unmuted? You are, Fillmore. Okay, good. <laughs> Just checking. Um, I don't have a lot to add. I think uh, my fellow board members and the, uh, historic, the historic Charleston Preservation Society have um, uh, have made adequate comments on this. Um, I will just join in the idea that I think um, the street presence of the structure uh, is a little overwhelming for this neighborhood and particularly the height and the roof form and the general architectural direction does not seem uh, to be compatible with the general architecture in the neighborhood. There are a number of houses very close to this, including 29, I think, uh, 129, 125, uh, that's on the corner that faces Vanderhorst and then uh, another house on the opposite side of the street, all of which are, are uh, principally two-story houses um, with significantly uh, less dramatic impact on the street. So uh, I am in line with uh, my fellow board members uh, and staff. Um, Lindsay, do you have any anything to add to this? I do not. Okay. Um, I will... I will go ahead and make a motion for, for denial for height, scale, mass, general architectural direction, and zoning conformity with staff comments, all the staff comments except for number four with regard to the site layout. Okay, we have a motion on the floor for denial for height, scale, mass, general architectural direction, and zoning conformity with staff comments uh, one, two, three, five, six, and seven. Do I have a second? Uh, I'll second. I will second. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no more. Go right. I, I'll second it and 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 maybe just reiterate um, that that I think the the strength of emotion again respectfully is in the height scale mass and general architectural direction um uh there, there can still be some research into zoning conformity if there's a question about that but but the others certainly carry that motion in my mind as well okay i'll put it to a vote Fillmore. a in favor julia a in favor 
Eddie? Yay, in favor. Chair votes with the majority and the motion passes unanimously. Okay, we are on agenda item number 432 Ann Street. Kim, if you'd provide an introduction and overview of this project, please. Thank you, Lindsay. In just one moment. All right. Number four, 32 Ann Streets requesting preliminary approval for new screening wall to conceal new mechanical system and transformer at sidewalk, new construction of exit stair, loading dock, and removable ramp. The building's category two in the Ragborough neighborhood it was built in 1848 in the old and historic district. Here's an aerial for your familiarity. One of the tra train sheds on the north side of Ann Street. And here's some existing site images. This is the east side. The proposed changes are along the west side. Looking west on Ann, here are the Sanborn maps from 1888 and shows unchanged through 1955. And with that said, I'll turn it over to the applicant, Ms. Whitney Powers. Hello, I, um, I'm Whitney Powers. That's my daughter in the photograph <laughs> on the screen. But um, uh, so I'm Whitney Powers. I'm the uh, principal architect with Studio A Incorporated. And we've been asked to um, renovate the uh, existing music farm, update it, and um, so that it can be once again activated as a, uh, a local music venue. Um, it will be our, the owner is also uh, affiliated with the music hall. And I've asked Lee Christensen um, of Frank Productions to be available if there are any questions that relate to the owner's side. Um, this has, the building has been vacant for a number of years. Um, it's actually in a uh, kind of raggedy uh, condition at this stage. Um, and one of the primary uh, components of the interior work is to upgrade the heating and uh, the HVAC system uh, so that it would operate uh, under those conditions. And uh, it is the systems that are in place uh, date from the 1993 renovation and are the equivalent of four uh, or 60 tons total, four 15 ton units. Um, and the uh, units themselves are uh, within an existing triangular um, or sort of rhomboid shaped uh, enclosure that is between the stage door entrance um, to the north and then to the south is an emergency egress uh, uh, entrance. Along that west side, this is, uh, has, there's a uh, 15 foot wide alley um, access easement um, that actually uh, runs the full length of this building. The original tenants were the Trident uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, I believe, and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, visitors convention visitors bureau, and um, and now it's the Charleston School of Law, and uh, there are some law offices that are also in that in that area. So. If you look at the photographs, this the in this first drawing, you see that um, um, you see that there is uh, those some images that are associated with those HVAC units in the existing courtyard. Um, because of distance, the 
uh, the types of units that had been used don't function properly because of the length of the refrigerant lines. And, um, and the uh, owners have decided that using a chiller system um, is in the best interest of those operations. Um, and a chiller is a single, uh, the exterior component is a single piece of equipment, and then it feeds the four uh, air handlers that are, would be in the corners of the building, um, just as they are now, those of you who, who've uh, found yourself at the music farm. Um, as you can see, the uh, existing uh, kind of enclosure for the existing units has been um, damaged uh, and there is a loading dock that is, um, uh, I have heard more harrowing stories about uh, equipment moving in and out on this uh, loading dock than um, you can imagine. But, um, but also it, it is one of the exit, fire exits for the, um, the stage and um, an original stair that would have uh, been to grade from that area is actually no longer there. And it's a rather steep ramp. So our proposal, um, if we go to the next slide, please, um, Kim. Our proposal is to remove the existing enclosure um, and reconfigure the loading dock so that it um, has an exit stair um, and then uses a, um, a portable ramp that would slide um, and be stored underneath the dock uh, at other times. And, um, and then preserving the three existing parking spaces along that side um, and building a, using the same details um, that are in the other, these other enclosures, we would provide a mechanical equipment enclosure that would clean up um, this area uh, adjacent to the kitchen door where there is um, an exterior mop sink um, that has been vandalized on numerous occasions, as well as an existing transformer um, that uh, has its own requirements for clearances and so forth. Um, so we're moving, we've enlarged the dock then um, to some degree and then create this um, uh, mechanical equipment enclosure, as well as extending a fence that would, um, and gate that would keep the uh, stairs into the kitchen off limits and protect, there's, a, there's an existing gas meter um, against the building in that location. So, um, so those, are the, those are the nature. Um, on this drawing sheet, uh, there's some images um, that show you some of the details or, or provide you some indication of, of that we would essentially base this enclosure on these with a uh, brick screening on each side. Um, we probably would leave off the razor barbed wire um, just since that's probably not a Charleston feature that we would want to make um, visible. Uh, but you're probably looking at a similar height of equipment which you can um, see in this uh, enclosure. This is some of the equipment and this enclosure has been enlarged to some degree where the, um, for the law school. Um, and, uh, and then here is a more uh, intact version of the, um, of the enclosure that is in place now. So you, you essentially have to the bottom of the, uh, the cap of this, a five foot brick wall, and then um, a course that takes this uh, on up to uh, just at six feet. So um, we would also pick up on the street, there is a coping wall um, with a, a stretch of fence um, that is the same details as you have across the street um, where the, uh, um, where the Children's Museum and, um, and the bus facility are, and our details for the gate and for um, the other fencing and the copings and so forth would 
follow the same um, set of details. So um, we, um, so those are really the, that's the nature of the beast. Um, the, uh, the, the dimensions, this is, uh, Kim, I did send you um, a, a request by the mechanical engineer that the gate be somewhat wider. Um, and so uh, I believe there's two foot returns on either side and a 10 foot wide gate um, so that the equipment could be removed um, if, it need, if need be. Um, you can see dashed in uh, the tree that we're um, requesting to remove. We did meet with Lee Batchelter um, and he had visited the site um, and recognized um, this as uh, a suitable, uh, from his perspective, he saw no issues on the zoning side with what we were proposing. So um, this is uh, visible from the right of way, but it is a private access easement. So, um, and I do know that that's within jurisdiction of the BAR, but just, it's really ratty along that um, access easement. And obviously um, uh, anything that we can do to basically make what you see from Ann Street a little more, um, a little nicer, um, because this is the avenue that many people take to get to King Street from the visitor center garage. So um, I think that this enclosure near the street that kind of makes a mechanical yard where we have the transformer and this, um, and this chiller enclosure, um, it basically sort of pulls those things together and, and essentially um, gives a, a, a neater sort of foreground that's visible from um, Ann Street than what is visible there now. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Uh, do my fellow board members have any questions for the applicant? I have just a, a brief one. Whitney, this is Eddie Favor. The, the, the view from Ann Street, and I was just pulling it up on Google Earth, needless to say, I can tell it looks like the transformer stays and the, and the masonry wall that's there stays as well. Is that like an iron? Oh yeah, that's the- That's that front. detail of that fence that's there, okay. yeah. Got it. Um, and that, that pathway would still remain because it would be a, a access or an egress from, from the music- From the kitchen, the yeah. Oh, oh, kitchen, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the chiller screen would be immediately behind that. So from Ann Street, you'd be looking up that staircase, but the, the, the element would be enclosed beyond with the, the brick screen. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Is there anything that encloses that transformer element or is it, uh, it just the rail from the staircase? Is it? Is it mm, um, I mean, now it's just sits there. And um, right. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with all of the um, dimensions that Dominion yes. requires for that. And so that's where we basically held it off four feet from the transformer pad um, uh, as a minimum so that, because I don't think we can put a, uh, we're not proposing to put a uh, an enclosure in front of the transformer um, mm -hmm. or even bollards, but that uh, that's really an existing condition and the slab of the transformer comes up within about eight inches of the uh, of that uh, that kind of strip of of parking and mechanical sorts of systems and things along Got there. It. And then one last question, and I'll, I'll I'll let us go on. But is is there an opportunity that and, and maybe that's still dictated by Dominion, but that that as you would enter that that stair from the kitchen <laughs> to the end street, that there's some type of uh, uh, extension of that wall or, or, or screening element there that screens the transform or does that need to remain open as far as well that? we're proposing that we take that picket um yeah. the 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 fence uh mm -hmm. and um and take that alongside that stair um, oh, I see. so I'm that sorry. it's there's a fence behind the transformer so two okay. sides of it are related to the 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 fence and then the enclosure of the chiller is then in the language of the other uh, enclosing 
enclosing sort of yard things. Okay, very good, sorry, I missed that note, thank you. No, no problem. I'll, I'll chime in with one quick question. Um, so the new enclosure will be solid brick, right? That you've got enough clearance that you don't need perforated brick or anything. Am I? We'll we will from? still we'll we'll do this enclosure just like the others are. So we're the intention is to provide panels. They're not as large. They're not as the the other panels uh, on that sloping side are about twenty two feet long. Um, we're looking at panels that are uh, uh, about eight, I think it's, it's dimensioned there. Um, hold on a second. Um, the dimension of it is 11.4. So it's about half the length uh, that is the, uh, the brick screen on either side of that chiller. So that, I mean, from an urban, uh, an urbanist standpoint, it's good to basically have that view even filtered that uh, into that chiller area and to the other areas um, beyond. Thank you. Omar Wilson here. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Julie. No, no, I'm good. No, I would just, um, and so the, uh, just to follow up on Julia's question, because I had a, had a similar question, the, um, uh, the new enclosure, uh, which the chiller sits besides facing the what is now a parking space and then Ann Street, those two sides, at least part of them, are pierced brick. Yes, like the We're, like the, the old. Yes, and and it, it, the entire distance or the distance. To the mm -hmm. stair area on the front side, or that's what I'm saying. It's, about it's, half of it was pierced, and about half of it solid. Is that correct? It's, a, it's eleven feet four of the opening is is the perforated is the is the staggered brick screen wall, and then it's a solid brick basically against the landing of the uh, where you come out of the kitchen, right. um, and then also. Um, the the window that's and then it's it's got a notch in it because it's that's a window that's closed up where there's a uh, a cooler inside so it's not um the yeah. glass there's been blacked that's out right. so um so anyway those two areas basically mirror each other so there's 11 feet four on either side that is the brick okay. screen which is pierced brick okay yeah i think i can see it now in a Blow the drawing up a little bit, see the, the difference in the, in the nomenclature on the drawing. Okay, is that just to keep the style similar to the old one, or is that required for ventilation for the chiller? Um, it is partly to do that. I mean, that's what I was saying. It, it basically gives you a view into that area from an urban standpoint. Um, you don't really want um, it's only a six foot tall wall. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, you just don't want to invite people to go into it. Um, and so the screening is there basically to, to, to provide, uh, not only sure. ventilation, but also to, to, uh, to assure that you could actually walk around the thing and see into it. Or as a safety consideration. As a safety <laughs> consideration. Keep it, keep it less yeah. private. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Thank you. They, they have had some trouble there with vandalism and things uh, on the stairs. And um, and so that's something that we, and uh, I mean, my office is, I walk down this alley and it's to some parking that I have back behind the building where I am. And so um, it's, it does, um, you, there's a reason why they've got razor barbed wire at the law school end. So, I understand. Thank you. Any more board questions at this time? All right, uh, Kim. Let's move on to public comment. We have Aaron Minigan. Thank you, Erin Minigan with the Preservation Society of Charleston. 
Uh, this proposal was a bit hard to understand without an elevation drawing, but generally we are concerned about moving the enclosure further toward the right of way where it would be more conspicuous. We would prefer to see the enclosure remain near its existing location to be less visible from Ann Street and avoid potential impacts to existing window openings. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Kim, we have a paper have... Oh. You there, April? So, I, no comment. Oh, my apologies. Is that it for public comment? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right, uh, then if you'll please give us city staff comments and recommendations. Thanks, Lindsay. We would prefer to see the mechanical systems remain as far away from the sidewalk as possible on this category two building. Aside from the vis visibility aspect, we presume this unit will be quite loud and detracting from the historic nature of the corner of the building and possibly a detriment to the historic fabric of the building. So staff's recommending deferral for restudy and final review by staff. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Ms. Powers, did you want to um, clarify or respond to anything raised during public comment or city staff comments? Well, I can appreciate uh, this, this sort of notion of it being um, visible, uh, wanting it to be further away from the, um, the street. Um, at the same time, we've been, we have two tasks. One is to preserve the, um, is, to, is to expand a loading dock that is sub, does, does not serve this, um, venue at the moment, um, and also to provide uh, for a way of, of consolidating that equipment. Um, there's actually an existing grease trap that's the small box next to the fence. Um, and uh, the perforated brick screen will in fact dampen the, um, the noise any noise that this might uh, provide. Um, and so I'm, I'm loath to say that, that putting this elsewhere um, actually serves um, uh, without losing what are uh, some available sort of parking spaces and providing for uh, the egress in and out of the building. Um, this area where we're proposing is, um, is very, um, it's not maintained, nor are much of the areas along the, uh, along the street there. Um, I think you would find that across the street, there are likewise um, equipment and, uh, and other things that are closer to Ann Street than even um, what we're proposing here. So um, uh, um, I, I think that uh, the, the, uh, the questions or the comments raised uh, really don't resolve uh, as many of the issues related to this site as where we have proposed that this go. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Okay, uh, we'll move into board discussion and a vote at this point. Um, I'll start, this is Julia. And I, I think I, it would be helpful to have elevations that would have helped um, me understand everything that's going on, although it is written on the plans. Um, but I feel like the applicant has done a good job. I think she's balancing a lot of considerations that are all valid and, um, you know, just looking at the street view of, of 32 Ann from Ann Street, I feel like this is gonna be pretty minimally impactful in terms of, of changing the public's experience of this property. Um, and I, I think it would be hard, as she said, to, to accommodate that chiller and make these important changes in another way. Um, 
if I could just add one final question for Whitney. Um, the tree that's closest to Ann Street, that's, that will stay, correct? Yes. Okay, thank it, you. It is the, uh, a hackberry, but it's grown into the fence there, so. I, th I think I'm comfortable with that personally, but I'm curious what other people think. Um, Elmore Wilson here. Um, I think I'm in line with, with Julia on this. Uh, that's not a terribly appealing view down the side of that building now. And uh, I'm not sure that um, uh, an attractive pierced brick wall might not almost add to the, to the experience. Um, my, since there are no real details of this, um, of this wall, my hope would be because this is a category two building that where any new construction uh, abuts the historic structure that is isolated and not attached to the building, particularly not in a way that would damage historic material. Uh, I'm sure that enclosure can be built independent of the, the uh, historic wall that it's adjacent to. That's all I've got. Thanks. This is Lynn. Um, I agree that this alley um, is a little messy. I've had, I do use it quite often. Um, and I think Fillmore raised a, a good point that actually having this closer to the street might obstruct some of um, some of what's back there. I, I really don't have an issue with it. And I also echo Fillmore's comments that um, based on this being a category two building, I, I would hope that um, the construction wouldn't, uh, I guess, pierce the building in any way. Um, but that's really all I've got. I, I don't I don't have an issue with this. Um, I'll jump on briefly too, but but don't disagree. And it pulled up, which I think Kim had just done, or, or maybe Lindsay, you had, but the, the Google Earth and looking at it. Um, and, and think that it, it, it's balancing a lot of different problems. And perhaps rather than these things being piecemealed along the whole length of that building, it, it, it may be better addressed all in one location. We already have the, the massive transformer there. This will sit kind of neatly behind it. Um, but, but would ask the applicant as, as Fillmore and I think Preservation Society had noted that, that the, the attachment of it to the building or maybe lack thereof is, is the best approach if that works when the final details. Um, and even as much as the width of the landing, um, looking at that plan, but again, I, I'd certainly leave that up to the applicant but something that allows for space for that wall between that and the building um, that doesn't impact the window or the building at all um, and would, would be okay with it with, with that kind of caveat. Um, I'm going to float a motion for, I'm going to suggest conceptual approval with final review by staff and a board condition to isolate any new construction from the historic fabric. Okay, we have a motion on the floor for conceptual approval with final review by staff and a board comment to isolate any new construction from the historic fabric. Do I have a second? Phil Moore, I'll second. Thank you, Phil Moore. I'll put it to a vote. Uh, Eddie? I in favor. Julia? Stay in favor. Phil Moore? Stay in favor. And the chair votes with the majority and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number 564, Trad Street. Kim, you'll provide an overview, please. Oh, uh, please. All right, 64 Trad Street is requesting conceptual approval for expansion of the existing masonry wall across the driveway and to include a salvaged historic gate. The building's category two in Charlestown neighborhood was built in 1760 in the old and historic district. Uh, here's an aerial, you can see it there on the corner of Trad and uh, Meeting Street connected to 60 Meeting. And here's the um, east side of the wall. 
looking east on Trad, west on Trad. Here's the building itself, and here's 60 Meeting Street, connected by a party wall. 1902 and 1955 Sanborns. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Sebastian von Marshall. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Sebastian von Marshall, um, architect. Uh, for the clients who are wishing to extend the existing site wall and add a salvage gate at um, 64 Trad Street. Um, Kim, if you could go to the next slide, please. And there's a, an old survey. The next slide has an updated survey on the site, which reflects more uh, current condition with the pool in the back. Next slide, please. And oops. Mm, uh, site plan, uh, what I'd like to draw your attention to here is the distance of the proposed wall uh, from the front of the house. So if we zoom in there, you can see it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a ways back. It's about 42 and a half feet um, from the uh, corner of the house on Trans Street. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see the existing house, uh, as Kim mentioned, 1760s uh, and um, recently renovated with new stucco. Um, scored stucco, uh, more in keeping perhaps with an early uh, 18th century or early 19th century building, more neoclassical. Um, lots of examples up and down the stretch of Trad Street. A lot of these were originally brick and then stuck it over, nice coins. Uh, you can see where there's a current um, portable toilet. And then if you zoom in a little bit uh, further down, you can see an electrical meter and a panel on the left-hand side of the wall. This is the uh, east facing elevation. There it is. And you can see the existing um, stucco site wall uh, on the right side, separating 62 and 64 tread. Um, in the rear, the stucco wall uh, returns to the left in front of that uh, uh, accessory structure, which is part of the neighboring lot. You can also see um, a little terracotta patio that's being uh, that, that's further back there beyond the brick driveway. And um, let's see if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and some drawings of the elevation and section details. Uh, what I'd like to point out is, uh, for starters, there's a really nice um, tradition and precedent for uh, ironwork, uh, decorative ironwork up and down Trad Street here, gates, uh, balconies, all kinds of things. Some first period, some that were at later, and um, in various locations uh, relative to the structure. So, uh, for example, at 55 and 60 Trad, we see a very similar configuration of a um, driveway with a masonry wall and an iron gate at the rear kind of set back from the street. There are also plenty of examples where the wall and the gate are directly on the street. Um, so a, a, very, a very nice blend. And I think the proposal is very much in keeping with the, with the kind of alternating nature of, of that um, uh, location. I, uh, the owner would like to add the wall um, for a couple of reasons, privacy uh, primarily, obviously, foot traffic uh, is very high in this area, and they do plan to use that terrace in the back for, for their enjoyment. Um, the pool back there requires a barrier of some kind, uh, so that's the second issue, um, and, uh, and uh, obviously just to restrict access to the back of the site as well. So the proposal is for a uh, stucco wall that aligns in height with the existing site wall. Uh, and you can see it there on the right, shaded in, this, in the elevation. Um, that would come across with two uh, uh, brick uh, stucco piers um, with um, permidian on top. And then a gate that was salvaged from 7 Trad Street. So uh, I guess one block over on the other side of church. Um, that they would like to reuse. Uh, we believe it is first period from the third quarter of the 18th century. So it would speak to the um, character of the original house, obviously not original to this location, but as I mentioned, a lot of the ironwork on the street has um, you know, been moved around a little bit. We think uh, the scale of it is fitting, the level of ornament is fitting, um, whereas the stucco wall is really more a response to the uh, stucco finish, the scored stucco finish of the main house so again, you know, perhaps uh, stylistically 75, 80 years later, we're now in the early 19th century, um, but essentially it would also pick up on the existing stucco finish on the other site wall. So really a, a fairly unintrusive um, addition, we believe. And um, the, the bottom line is that uh, the owner would like to make as small of an impact on the, um, on the streetscape. So the, 
wall and gate are detailed um, very appropriately, we feel, but again, it's location and it's sort of sympathetic design with the contact, within the context makes it, you know, recede almost um, from, from, the, uh, from the view. So with that, I would like to um, thank you for your time and um, welcome any questions. Thank you, Yvonne Marshall. Uh, do my fellow board members have any questions for the applicant? Uh, Fillmore Wilson here. I have a question uh, along the same lines as the, uh, as the previous submittal, um, where the new wall engages uh, the wall of the historic house. Um, it's not detailed in the, uh, in the drawings. Is there an attachment plan there or is there going to be an expansion joint? Uh, well, I'm not calling for an expansion joint per se right now. The idea is that the uh, structural stucco would obviously not be connected to the structural masonry of the building. It would simply be a stucco joint that would um, connect the two. So no real structural connection, more of a superficial aesthetic connection. Keeping in mind that the stucco on the house was also just replaced. Do you know the uh, makeup of the, uh, of the stucco? on the house today? Uh, I do not. Unfortunately, that renovation was not um, a project of mine. OK, thank you. Any other board questions? All right. Um, Kim, we'll move on to public comment. We don't have any for this project. All right, uh, then if you will give us city staff comments and recommendations, please. Uh, the fence and wall is entirely appropriate and we support it. So we're recommending final approval. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Mr. Von Marshall, did you want to respond uh, to the staff comments? Uh, no other response. Um, I uh, would love to get final approval on this. Um, but uh, if there are any other questions, I'd certainly be happy to take them. All right, uh, let's, I'll open it up for board discussion and a vote at this time. Um, I'll start, no more. I, I, I'm fine with this. I think it's, it's very nice. I agree with staff. My concern is, is that um, if the stucco is going to be, if a, a stucco on the main house is to be cut as it appears the drawing shows in the wall, abutted to the house, um, oh, it would be nice to know, it would be, I'm sorry, uh, it would be nice to know if, if uh, what the makeup of the, of the stucco on the original house is, if it's early, um, if it's modern, if it's been uh, repaired significantly or replaced, um, if there's not gonna be a little space there to compensate independent movement and it, uh, it should not be fastened mechanically to the existing house and the stucco on the new wall should match the makeup of the stucco on the house. That would be my concern and that, I'm, I'm fine with approval. I would just uh, like to see some assurance that uh, that thing is gonna be done delicately on a cat two house. Elmo, this is Julia and I, if that were to become a motion, I would be willing to second it. Okay. Fillmore, did you make a motion for final approval with a board comment um, that the makeup of the stucco on the wall should match the stucco on the house? Um, yes, I think that would work. And, and also um, that the new wall not be mechanically attached to the structure of the historic house. So two board comments and the second board comment is that the um, new wall not be mechanically attached to the house. Yeah, to, yeah, to the historic house. Yeah, I, th I think the wall on the other side is, it's hard to talk from the photographs, but I think it's, it's probably much more modern, but uh, I'm a little bit uh, concerned about, you know, there's a possibility the stucco on the house is, um, is, is much newer, it could even be Portland, um, but you won't know that unless you actually examine it. So, but I think under, under any circumstances that wall shouldn't be mechanically attached to the historic fabric. Okay. Do I have a second for Fillmore's motion? I'll second that. Thank you, Julia. 
Lindsay, for clarity, can you repeat that? Please? Yes. Um, the motion was final approval uh, with two board comments. Um, first, that the makeup of the stucco on the wall should match the stucco on the house. And a second comment that um, the new wall not be mechanically attached to the historic fabric of the house. Thank you. Uh, and now for a vote, Eddie. Uh, in favor. Fillmore. Hey, in favor. Julia. Hey, in favor. And the chair votes with the majority and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Von Marshall. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Agenda item number six has been deferred by the applicant, and we are now on agenda item number seven, 42 Bull Street. Kim, provide an introduction, please. Thank you. We'll let in Becky. Okay, 42 Bull Street is requesting conceptual approval for a new accessory structure at the rear of the building's a category three and is in the Harleston Village neighborhood. It was built in 1880 in the old historic district. Here's an aerial for your familiarity. It's on the north side of Bull between Pitt and Smith. Here it is again. It's the Piazza side and the opposite side, the east side. Uh, you may remember Ms. Fenno has recently undergone res uh, uh, approval to remove this door and to restore the building back to single family and, um, and for a rear addition. This is looking east on Bull and south on Lagree <laughs> and west to the on Bull. <laughs> Here are the Sanborn maps from 1902 and 1944. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant for her presentation. Thank you, this is Becky Fenno. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, as Kim mentioned, we are requesting an accessory building uh, the northern end of the lot at 42 Bull Street. Next slide, please. This is the site survey prior to the construction of the addition. Next slide, please. These are the Sanborns. Uh, as Kim just showed, just wanted to talk about a couple of things. There is a history of accessory buildings on the site. It's also just interesting to note that there's the, the patterns in this neighborhood are a little bit different um, or, or just are are those where you see an accessory building down the driveway or parallel to the rear property line. Uh, and that's something that we will be asking for in this application. Next slide, please. These are the street views that we just saw. Next slide, please. These are a few more detailed shots of the building prior to the addition. And I just wanted to note that at the bottom left is the rear of the property. We're looking to the north where the uh, accessory building would be located. Next slide. These are precedents within a block or two of the property. And uh, there's a variety of accessory structures that are seen down the driveway that are both uh, sort of simply one story garages as well as uh, as well as garages with living space above. Next slide. This is the site plan and I am showing the addition that's being built uh, on these site plans for, so you can fully understand the context. At the bottom, you can see the location we're requesting for the accessory building. I did wanna note that the, the owner is eligible to build a full second building on this property. Uh, we could build another unit. Uh, they did not want to do that. They did not feel that they needed that, that, that much of a building behind the main building. And they also didn't, didn't want to take up the entire yard. They wanted to leave a, the green space and really create a composition where they had the front building on the street. And then the accessory building was running parallel 
to the rear property line so that they could maximize the green space on the property. Next slide, please. These are the plans for the accessory structure, uh, the, the garage space at the ground floor with a pedestrian door uh, facing the house, as well as a pedestrian door that's, that's a little bit more private at the top right. Uh, and the second floor with a living space and an office and a bathroom. Next slide, please. These are the elevations at the top left is the south elevation facing that, the main house and facing Bull Street. Uh, and I, I just wanted to note that I was notified just prior to the meeting uh, that the dormer width, uh, basically the section of the, of the dormer ordinance has changed to be 30%. So we would be modifying the width of that dormer to accommodate that, that would be nine feet. Uh, that would be reduced to nine feet in this proposal. But really looking at um, the, the, the doors, um, the two garage doors and a pedestrian door facing the house. And then at the bottom left is uh, the east elevation facing number 38 with uh, the closed gable similar to the main house and then uh, the north elevation at the top right and the west elevation at the bottom right. And we're really just trying to use a vocabulary uh, that's similar to the main house uh, with the lap siding and the double hung windows. Next slide, please. This is the street elevation existing and then proposed at the bottom. Next slide, please. These are the perspectives uh, showing the visibility of the structure from Bull Street, just shown from different angles. And we, again, we did include the addition so that the full context could be evaluated. Next slide, please. And this is the east side uh, as seen with number 38 on the right adjacent to it. Thank you, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Fenno. Uh, do my fellow board members have any questions for the applicant? I have a quick one. Um, Becky, I assume there's maybe some landscape plan or something that was driving the location of this accessory dwelling. Is, can you just explain kind of why your strong preference was to have it at that location on the site? Sure, thank you. Um, we uh, really did, we wanted to kind of minimize the driving space to kind of come straight up the driveway and into the left-hand bay of the garage. The client may or may not use the right bay. And really their intent was to have a lot of space off the rear porch of the building so that they could either have a porch or just kind of a very long garden between the main house and the and the garage. Thanks. Any other board questions? All right, we'll move on to public comments. Um, Kim, I see one letter from the Harleston Village Association, which I'll read, but first, uh, do we have anyone speaking for the public? We have Erin Minigan. Thank you, Erin Minigan with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out to us on this request. Generally, we are struggling with the horizontal proportions of this proposal that we feel are being driven by the long shed dormer. We recommend breaking the single dormer into two vertical dormers over each garage bay and reflect this on the rear elevation. We ask for continued study of this treatment as the project moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Kim, do we have anyone else speaking from the public? No, we don't. All right, now uh, we have a letter from the Carlson Village Association um, dated September 22nd, 2021. Dear board members, the Harleston Village Association would like to express our concerns with the application for an accessory structure to the rear of 42 Bull Street. The size and height of the proposed building is out of character with the neighborhood and much larger than most, of, than most other structures of this type in our neighborhood. 
The neighborhood association did not oppose the large addition to the main structure, which is underway, as it was seen as an improvement and would return the building to single family. We, however, have not had any contact with the applicants re regarding this request. In previous cases similar to this, we have successfully worked with the owners to come up with an appropriate solution that is much smaller and appropriate for the historic properties. Two examples are cited by the applicant, 23 Montague and 73 Bull. We request that these two examples should be used as a template for the new building at the rear of 42 Bull Street. 42 Bull Street is a category three structure and any, and any new building should respect the main house as well as the surrounding neighborhood. Garages and accessory structures are not a common occurrence in the neighborhood and therefore should be carefully considered. The Neighborhood Association requests that this application be denied or deferred until the size and height of the proposed structure are significantly reduced. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, signed the Harleston Village Association Zoning and BAR Subcommittee. And that is all for public comment. Now, Kim, if you would provide city staff comments and recommendations. Thank you, Lindsay. We feel that this proposal would be better sited on the opposite corner, rotated 90 degrees, reducing visibility, concealing its large scale, and to be more in keeping with the traditional patterns of secondary buildings in Charleston. The massing of the roof feels largely out of scale. Perhaps the shift will reduce its visibility. The rake of the dormer seems to have an exaggerated overhang, making it feel oppressive and heavy. The roof pitch of the gable return and the pediments too high and should be lowered. The siding at the dormer windows should be eliminated so that the window trim is on the edge of the dormer. Per ordinance, the aggregate width of dormers on a half story shall not exceed 30% of the width of the exterior wall below the dormer, which is 54306 paragraph eight. So the staff's recommending deferral with staff comments noted. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Ms. Finno, did you want to respond or clarify anything raised during public comment or in the city staff comments and recommendations? Um, I'll respond that um, I, I think we could uh, definitely work on the, the dormer proportions. Uh, as mentioned, I think the, the height scale and mass actually is really something that we're, we're seeing in accessory buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, and the, the ones mentioned by the Harleston Village Association are, are some of the only one story structures that have been built. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Benham. All right, we'll move into board discussion and a vote at this point. Uh, I can start. Um, I, Kim, if, if you don't mind just letting us look again at the composite elevation from from Bull Street, that one. I mean, you know, I can I can hear some of the concerns when I look at this two dimensional composite elevation, but I think you know the reality of, of perspective and distance re really result in a in a different effect. Um, can somebody remind me what the, the actual distance is from the sidewalk to the front of this proposed structure? Is that clear on the site plan? Not really. Um, not really. But it, it seems substantial, similar to some of the precedent photos that she provided. Um, I think I'm okay with the orientation where it is and it will allow them to have a really generous garden space. Um, but I, I, I would also agree with staff, a, a lot of staff's comments regarding just kind of refinement and, and um, development of some of those details. And of course the dormer will have to be restudied and I appreciate the Preservation Society's comment about the dormer maybe being divided into two. That's all I've got. Bill Moore here. Um, I would generally be in line with staff's comments. In an ideal world, I would certainly rather see this building rotated 90 degrees and, and, and open the opposite corner. 
um, behind the main house because that's a more traditional pattern. However, I, I recognize the, uh, the reason for orienting it this way, and I think it is a long way from the street. I would be more inclined to uh, be more sympathetic to the orientation. I think if the detailing of the structure were more refined, I agree with staff. I think the roof and the dormers are, are heavy and they, uh, they contribute to the mass of the building. I think refinement of the details, particularly the roof and the dormers, um, and some of the other detailing uh, to make this a slightly more delicate building, I think it would make its orientation uh, more palatable. I'll agree with my fellow board members, and I think Ms. Finn has demonstrated that there is a pattern of, of structures like these in this orientation, and if, if particularly with the distance from the street, uh, that, that orientation is mitigated and the ability to have more in the way of green spaces is, is quite nice. Um, uh, readdressing the dormer situation and if in doing so there's an ability to, to mitigate some of that height, I think that would be well received. <clears throat> um, can I staff a quick question? Staff, um, would you, you, you had recommended deferral um, if this were to be conceptually approved, do you have a preference as to whether it comes back to the board or is resolved at staff level? I have heard all your comments and I'm comfortable following your lead and I, I can do it. Um, we can take care of it at the staff level. All right. Um, with that said, I will make a motion for conceptual approval with staff comments two through six. All right, we have a motion on the floor for conceptual approval with staff comments two, three, four, five, and six. Do we have a final, final review by staff? I'm sorry. And final review by staff. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second that. This is Eddie. Okay. Um, and now I'll put it to a vote. Fillmore. Um, okay, staff's comfortable um, reviewing this with uh, their comments. I will vote yay in favor. Fillmore. Julia. Yay in favor. Eddie. Yay in favor. Chair votes with the majority and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Fenno. Thank you. And we are now- um, Go anywhere. Final item on the agenda. Uh, agenda item number 895 Line Street. Kim, you will give us an introduction, please. Thank you, Lindsay. 95 Line Street's requesting conceptual approval for the reconstruction of a non- Historic addition on the west elevation, including second story. The building's category four in the Canterborough neighborhood was built sometime between 1852 and 1872 in the old city district. Uh, just for some context, here's the building at the corner of Line and Cumming Street on the south side. And some images um, of the building. This is on Cumming Street. Here's looking north on coming and looking south. Looking west on Line Street, looking east. Here's the survey card from the 1985 survey. Sandborn maps from 1902 and 1944. You can see this building, this tenement building is no longer there. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you, this is Becky Fenno. I'll be presenting 95 Line Street. I did wanna give a little bit of context, which is that we presented this the, the entire project to you and were granted conceptual approval last July. Um, and then, uh, the property was sold and the new owner is, is now 
passionate about pursuing the restoration that was previously approved. Uh, but during our selective demolition, we did find out that the, the non-historic one-story addition on the west side needs to be rebuilt. And we thought there was an opportunity when we rebuild it to, um, we're, we're requesting from you when we rebuild it, uh, could we rebuild it as a two-story uh, addition and restore the piazza of the main building on the south side of the building. So that's that's really what we're what I'm requesting this evening is really an addition almost to that previous approval for this full renovation. And there was a request at that meeting that this renovation come back to the board for final approval for the details. And I believe that was primarily focused on the storefront. Uh, but but that's uh, I just wanted you to bear that in mind as you look at this request. Next slide, please. These are the Sanborn maps. Uh, the original building on Line Street uh, at the left was uh, an L with a basically a two-story piazza at the south and west. And uh, by 1955, there was a rear two-story dwelling constructed. And then between 1955 and the present day, really multiple, the building underwent just multiple uh, modifications, enclosures, additions. Uh, primarily, I wanted to note that the west side of the piazza was, uh, to, to call it enclosed would be gracious. It really looks like it was really torn off and rebuilt with siding and a random assortment of windows. That's in the pink on the top right. And then the addition to the left in blue is a one-story addition that was added and then as Kim noted, that long uh, tenement building was demolished by this time. Next slide, please. This is uh, the building at the, and we just saw these pictures, but on the bottom left is a, a helpful photo in terms of understanding our request, which is we'll be taking off the metal stair you can see the form of the old piazza there, the two-story form, uh, and then the one-story addition to the left. Next slide, please. This is the, the view of the west elevation. And on the top at the left, you can see the original two-story volume of the building facing Line Street. And then the one story addition is the portion that, we're, that we need to rebuild. Uh, it was very poorly built. The, the untreated lumber is sitting on the concrete slab and there's modern siding that, that's in, in disrepair and modern windows. And that's a 5B, that's a bit of the 5B roof on that. And then, so we're requesting when we demolish that to, to build it uh, back in two stories uh, that, that portion that you're seeing in the distance, the two-story porch enclosure, or what used to be kind of the piazza, uh, is all modern framing and modern windows. Uh, and in the top left, I, I want to note that that little pilaster on the second floor is a good datum point, um, because to the left of that pilaster, we'll be doing the two-story addition. And then to the right, we'll be restoring the piazza at the south of the building. Next slide, please. These are some photo, detailed photos of both the one-story uh, non-historic portion, as well as the that second story wall, uh, which was used to be part of the piazza. And there are some columns that were used randomly, uh, it, it kind of recycled and reused inside the building. And we're hoping to re bring those to the exterior when we restore the porch on the south. Next slide, please. This is the site plan. So at the top is the area in question with the diagonal hatch. That's the area that we're going to, uh, we're requesting to demolish and rebuild a second story in that area. 
that the crosshatch to the left will be demolished, but nothing will be built in that area. And then where it says area to be enclosed, that's actually part of the restoration of the porch on the south side. Next slide, please. Uh, and we can, we can go to the next, uh, actually next slide and even the next one. This is a little bit more detailed view of the ground floor. Now you can start to see when we, when we rebuild that one story addition right where the, the cursor was, there's an opportunity to step that wall back now from the, that, that original volume of the main house right there. Uh, so that portion will be two stories. And then where the little kitchen is in unit A is part of the restoration of the porch on the south. Next slide, please. Um, let's even go to the next one, please. The, the second floor actually I feel is where you can really read our proposal. Uh, and uh, what we're requesting is there at the top, you can see the two story. Uh, uh, actually the top is actually, uh, you, at the top of the screen is the previous plan. And you can see the roof of the one story addition that we're proposing to demolish. And then uh, we have an opportunity if we go to the bottom plan to set that wall back on the west. And now you can really see the restoration of the porch on the south side of the main building and how that would really clean up uh, that, that portion of the building and the geometry there. Uh, next slide, please. The, the only piece of historic fabric that's really left uh, in, in this area of, that we're considering is that a piece of the turn metal roof that's over the piazza. Next slide, please. This is the elevation on Cumming Street. Next slide. So at the bottom is our proposal where uh, you could see how everything in the, the porch actually on the south will be restored and it will create a good, a nice hyphen and division between the main house on the right and then the two story uh, cottage that was added later. Next slide. This is the elevation on Line Street. And really the only thing that's changing is the, on the top right, you can see the one story addition peeking out a little bit uh, on the right on the first floor. And that uh, when that's demolished, obviously that will be recessed back. Next slide, please. This is the west elevation. Next slide. At the top was our previous proposal and at the bottom is our proposal where we are requesting to remove, uh, demolish the one story addition and rebuild that. And in, when we do that, we can really simplify the geometries of all the additions that have been done over time. We can, um, the two story addition will be subordinate to the, the main house, which is on Line Street. And then as you work to the right, you can see that the, the porch on the south of the main house gets restored uh, and really reads as more of a, of a division between the main house and the back building. Next slide, please. Ms. Bino, you've got about two minutes left. This is the last elevation actually. So at the top right is the previous proposal and at the bottom right is our current proposal. Again, you can see how now there's just, the geometry is much cleaner where we have the restoration of the porch on the south, uh, which is just to the left of the, the cottage. And then there's the two story addition and then the, and that's kind of seated against the main house, which is on the street. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Benno. Um, do we have any questions for the applicant? All right, Kim, do we have any public comment? We have Erin Minigan. Thank you, Erin Minigan with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out to us on this request and would like to reiterate our support for the overall positive rehabilitation of the building. 
It is unfortunate the piazza has been so severely altered and infilled over time to the point that it's hardly discernible. As we weigh this against the positive effort to reopen the rear portion of the piazza, we are generally comfortable with the request to construct the second story addition as proposed. Moving forward, we would encourage further study of more elegant treatment options for the new infill, including study of incorporating more fenestration. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And it looks like we've got one from April. We do. April Wood, Historic Tulsa Foundation, HCF has met with the applicant and has reviewed the request for conceptual approval for the reconstruction of a non-historic addition on the west elevation, including a second floor, uh, 95 Line Street. We are pleased to see the much needed investment in this historic, cor historic corner store property, and we are supportive of this project. We believe that the improvements to the street facing elevations, especially the reestablishment of the wraparound portion of the piazza and the opening of the second floor connector space are significant positive changes that successfully highlight the important historic features of the house. We respectfully recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you, April. And Kim, I think that's it for public comment, right? Yes, it is. All right, if you will provide city staff comments and recommendations, please. We feel that the addition could really help this building, which has endured many insensitive layers of building campaigns over the decades. The addition should have some fenestration down the length of it, which would require a slight setback. This recess would also help delineate the historic core building at the street from this new addition. We commend the owner and architect for undertaking this project and look forward to seeing its completion. So we're recommending conceptual approval with final review by staff. Thank you, Kim. Um, Ms. Fino, did you want to respond or clarify anything raised in public comment or in the city staff comments and recommendations? Um, my only comment would be um, uh, is uh, we'll, we'll have to study the fenestration question uh, like many of the buildings in, in Charleston. Uh, the proximity to the to the property line will be an issue for us from a code standpoint. So I just have to take a, a close look at that and perhaps just discuss that with plan review before we come back with the details. Thank you, Ms. Benno. All right, we'll move into board discussion and a vote. Um, I'll start, it's Julia, it, I, I appreciate, I really am enjoying the fact that staff and both preservation groups seem to be on the same page with this, and I I would concur with all of them. Um, and to Becky's point about the setback, just the site plan doesn't have a dimension called out, but I know that if you can get to three feet from that line, which it looks like you're kind of close to three feet, then you'd be allowed to have some some fenestration, which, which would help, I think. Um, so I'm completely on board with staff's comments and recommendations. I like it. Bill Moore here. I am in agreement with Julia and staff. Yep, it's Lindsay. I, I have nothing to add. Um, I, I think this is, is really nice and, and I agree with staff comments. And... Agreed. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Okay. This was just conceptual for the for this application. Okay. Um, and just whoop, just to harp on it one more time, but the setback that I think staff is referring to is just at that portion where you're, you know, adding the second story. If that could just be pulled in enough strategically to to achieve some fenestration on the second floor, that would be helpful. So I will um, make a recommendation for conceptual approval with staff comments and final review by staff. All right, we have a motion on the floor for conceptual approval with staff comments and final review by staff. Do I have a second? No more, I'll second. Thank you, Phil Moore. And now I'll put the motion to a vote. Eddie? 
Uh, I in favor. Julia? Yay in favor. Bill Moore? Yay in favor. The chair votes with the majority and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Benno. Thank you, I appreciate it. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes, uh, motion to film or motion to adjourn. A second. I'll take Julia's nod. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, all